let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, I pray as always that this message is a message that you've got to have for your people. May the proud amongst us be humbled, but the humble lifted up. May secure sinners tonight be shaken, but the bruised in heart who confess their sins, may they be lifted up by you. May this word move past our mind into our heart and from our heart to our lives and conversations. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. What we're doing on Wednesday night is going through different, uh, well, it's inspired by the Lenten devotional that I hope that you guys are going through. Uh, this evening's message is actually going to have a long reading attached to it. So it's very important that you do open up your Bibles because it is going to be a long reading. I would like you to open up your Bibles, and I forgot to put it up there, Romans 7, 1 through 24. Romans 7, 1 through 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 7, 1 through 24. Romans chapter 7, 1 through 24. See, that's what happens, Joan, when Bill studies. I don't get, uh, I don't get the double check of the slide, you know what I mean? I know. I have to be an adult all by myself. It's rough. It's rough. It's rough. Romans 7, 1 through 24. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Hallelujah if you need more time. All right, Romans 7. Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit to God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code." What then shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin." For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. I know that was a very long reading. <clears throat> I am a man that needs a lot of help in life. <laughs> Joe's in the back going, yes, yes, he is. He's a man that needs a lot of help in life. So it is true. Now, some people think that I uh, am knocking myself when I say these things, but I, 
I have a nice, healthy opinion of my own esteem, and so uh, don't be afraid. I'm not knocking myself, but I do think that I have one or two, maybe on the outside, three uh, gifts. I, I can preach the word. I can share an idea. Amen. I can lift heavy objects. I'm good at that. And, uh, and I can garden. Uh, outside of those things, there's not much. What? Fish tank, and I can take care of fish. Axolotls have a little harder, but fish. I can. So there's a few things that I'm good at, all right? The rest of my life I need help with. My father, uh, excuse me, my father, my brother used to, now my brother, uh, now he passed away, but my brother was in construction. He owned his own construction business. And my brother, whenever we would come to visit, would always call my wife and would say, I need to know the list of everything that your husband has let break in the house since the last time I was there. Uh, and then she would inform him of everything that was broken in my house, and my brother would come down and fix everything that I screwed up. Uh, now that my brother has died, that job has been left to Joe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, so there's lots of things. I, I can't do them. I, I try, and then I fail. I need a lot of help in my life. We talked about Pam. Pam reminds me all the time. People have no idea that if it wasn't for Pam reminding me to do things, a lot of things wouldn't get done. But Pam consistently reminds me, hey, pastor, don't forget this. Hey, pastor, don't forget that. Hey, pastor, don't forget that. That's right. Oh, that's right. Oh, I do have that burial today. Yeah, all right, so important things that Pam reminds me of all the time. My beloved wife helps me with humility. Oh, don't why our wives great at helping husbands with humility. No, but in all honesty, my wife is in a, a wonderful prayer. She cares tremendously. She's very empathetic. Where I might not be as empathetic as I ought to be, I learned that from my beloved wife. The simple fact that I'm saying is I need a lot of help in my life. In order to succeed, in order to prosper, I need... What is that? Is that Siri talking about me? That was Siri responding. I even have Siri responding to me. This is crazy. <clears throat> all right, anyway, I don't know how that happened, but there we go. So, all right, now I want you to take that fact, the fact that Chris needs a lot of help in his life. He's good at a few things, but he needs a lot of help, and I need you to put that on a shelf. We're going to get back to that, okay? The Apostle Paul says something in our text that is exceptionally important. He says this, What shall we say, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I once was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved death to me. All right, when the Bible uses the word law in this way, what does it mean? Just think the Ten Commandments. So when it says that, what shall we say then? That the Ten Commandments are sin? Are the Ten Commandments sin, yes or no? No, that's ridiculous. Uh, yet, had it not been for the law, I would not have known sin. So, for example, acolyte, calico, you're going to come up here. Come on up, it's going to be fine. This is what happens when you become an acolyte. Pastor embarrasses you. All right, I need you to hold this placard. What does that placard say? Law. Law, is it right? Yeah, it's right. So now hold it against me, meaning like face me. All right. So this is what he's saying. I would not have known how terrible and miserable and horrible I am if it wasn't for me looking at the law. This is good right? But when I look at this, all of a sudden I find out some things about myself. What I find out about myself is I am not really good at a whole lot of things. The law says you shall not commit adultery. I haven't cheated on my wife, but then Jesus, of course, expands that to say, if you even lust after a woman, you've committed adultery. It says don't murder. Well, I haven't killed anybody. But then Jesus expands that to hate, even to call someone a fool. 
to protect other people's reputation. Don't ever lie. Only tell the truth. Never want anything in your life more than you love God. Don't ever misuse his name. Remember that Sabbath day. So when I see that, I thought that I was good, and all of a sudden, what do I find out about myself? Not only not so good, but what? I've fallen terribly. You know, my father told me something a long time ago, and it, within the context that he told it to me, I still hold on to that. But the statement itself is faulty. This is what my dad told me. Uh, it was within the context of relationships just in general, not just man, wife, but just relationships in general, when people would back out of their promises and things of that nature. My father had a saying, and he would say, Chris, don't ever forget, people do what they want to do. So basically what he was saying is, if they want to go back on their, on their promise, they're doing what they want to do. Don't ever forget that. Okay, understood. Having said that, that blanket statement, people do what they want to do, I've actually found that to be shockingly untrue with at least one case that I know personally. Guess what case that is? Me. I look at the law. I look at the Ten Commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't lust. I absolutely want to be pure. I look at the law. Don't lie. Tell the truth. I absolutely want to do that and thought word and deed. I look at the law. You shall have nothing in my face. I absolutely want to do that. Don't ever misuse my name. I absolutely want to do that. I know me. I know my heart. I know who I want to be. I look at the law and I say, that is what I want to do. And I 100% want to do it. I 100% want to put forth all my effort to please God and to love my neighbor. So what do I want to do? That. Guess what happens every single day? <sighs> I fail to do that. So my father's blanket statement, people do what they want to do. I understand what he was trying to get at. Basically, he was trying to say, hey, just remember that people are going to take advantage of you and believe them on their first time. That's what he's trying to get across. But in reality, keep holding up, Calico. I know you're bored, but you, you'll get through it. All right. Uh, <laughs> you'll get through it. All right. So when you look at the law, I want to do that. I really do love God, but I fail miserably. So that the very commandment that promised life, meaning the commandment said, do this stuff, and what will happen? You'll live. So I said, okay, I want to do this stuff. God says, do the stuff. I live. I want to live. I also love God. I'm going to do this stuff. And then I'm going to go, and I'm going to try really hard to do that stuff, and then what's going to happen? So he says, the very commandment that promised life proved what? Proved to be death to me because the law also said you disobey this and what? You die. So the very commandment that promised life, do it and live, actually produced in me death because I couldn't what? I couldn't do it. So Paul goes on. For we know that the law is spiritual, meaning the Ten Commandments are good. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I don't understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want. That's kind of what I just described. But I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. I want to do it, right? But then I fail. I don't do it. That doesn't make a lot of sense. If people do what they want to do, and you want to do the law, you should be able what? To do it. But I don't. I fail. Then what seems like an excuse, we'll get to it in a second. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do, that I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. 
So no, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a man by the name of John Wesley. A lot of us, okay. Famous Christian man. One of the reasons I'm not Wesleyan, he, he's in heaven, amen, praise God. But one of the doctrines that I consider dangerous as far as John Wesley was concerned was he believed in sinless perfection before leaving earth. He believed that you could get holy enough and good enough so that you could live in sinless perfection. Now, I had a young man come up to me after my co-op class, and it was very, uh, it was authentic, it was nice. And he came up to me and he said, you know, I go to this church that believes that we can be perfect. And he was troubled, you could see. You know how sometimes you can just look in a person, and he was troubled, and I'll tell you what was troubling this young man. He's a good kid. He's an honorable kid. Problem is, he knows this. And he knows how hard he's really trying to do this. And he's real honest about what goes on inside here. So when the preacher from the pulpit says, you can be completely sanctified and you can be holy and you can live a sinless life, what does that strike in this young man? Fear and terror. Because I know what? I know what's inside. This not only speaks a tremendous truth about us as people, but it also gives us tremendous hope because here's the thing. You aren't Paul, and neither am I. He's better than you, and he's better than me. And look what he wrote. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. No, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. He admits something. This right here should be the nail in the coffin of the doctrine of sinless perfection. The truth is that sin is more than just the bad stuff we outwardly do. See, a lot of, a lot of people that are not familiar with Christianity, or at least the Bible, think of sin in very simplistic terms. They think of bad stuff I do outwardly, or good stuff that I should do that I don't do. That's true. But sin goes much deeper. It goes to the thoughts, the attitudes, and the behavior of the heart. So we can feed the homeless all week. But if there's even a little tiny bit of you that are like, why can't these guys just get a job? You know what's going on inside. You know who else knows what's going on inside? God knows what's going on inside. We want to do good. We always seem to fail. We can do good things. What I've learned with a lot of people is a lot of people are good in their own eyes, meaning they pay taxes. They cut their lawns. They raise their own kids. They go to work every day. That seems to be their standard. That seems to be the standard of, what they're, uh, of good, meaning they dumb down this so much that it becomes what? Doable. Don't ever get tricked. This says what it says. And what it doesn't say is if you pay your taxes, if you raise your kids, if you feed them good food, if you go to work every day, you're fine. It says a lot more than that. And if you take an honest look at that, what you find out is you failed to do that. And if you failed to do that, even after you've put in all the strenuous effort you can do, what do you find out about yourself? What do you need? I need help. It's only at that point do you really understand what it means to be a Christian. Only when you've tried desperately and failed so that you finally understand I am in need of help. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil eyes close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Look what he calls it. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You remember in the beginning I said what we put on a shelf? 
What do we put on a shelf in the beginning? Chris can do a couple things, but everything else what? Here's the thing. <clears throat> used to really bother me. I would look at these things. I'm not making this up. I'd look at the little YouTube videos. I'd look at the manuals. And I'd say, today, I'm going to hang something. <laughs> and I would say, I'm going to be able to do this right and I'd try. I'd get the appropriate tools. It was so bad. It's almost like my hands wouldn't function to do the tiniest things. So all my friends laugh at me. Uh, they all come over and they're like, dude, you're so inept. And I'm like, I know, I, I know, I know, I know I am. Help me. <laughs> and then they're like, all right, we're going to help you. Uh, and they do. This used to bother me. Now I've come to a place in my life where what do I just recognize about me? I, in order to prosper, what? I need help. I'm shockingly dependent. And you know what that puts me in a very good place to understand? Christianity. What most people aren't recognizing is how shockingly we need help. You've tried really hard. You've tried your best to follow this. And you failed. The problem is a lot of people, when they look at it, they see that they failed, so they try and dumb it down. All I got to do is pay my taxes, feed my kids good, good food, make sure that they get a good job, and make sure that I work really hard. They dumb it all down so it becomes doable. That's the first reaction of most human beings. They will die and go to hell because they still believe that they're going to be right with God by what? By something they do. They will die and go to hell, and it will be very sad. Then there are the other people that look at this, and they recognize that they failed it miserably. They won't try and change it. They won't try and dumb it down. In desperation, they will lift up their hands and they will say what? Help. I need help. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, Christ Jesus our Lord. In our Lenten devotion, Luther wrote something. Even when you're old man, the old man means that old you that uh, sins. Even when your old man wins one way, do not look inwardly to improve. Rather, die in ashes, confess your sins, and rise again in Jesus. 80% of all New Year's resolutions fail, and they fail by February 1st. You want to know why? We know what we ought to be doing. I mean, honestly, do we not know what we ought to be thinking? Do we not know how we ought to be behaving? Do we not know what we ought to be speaking? Yeah, yeah, we know. That's exactly right, we know. And where do we look to find the strength, usually, to accomplish what we ought to accomplish? We look inside of ourselves. And we try and rev up. I'm doing it. I'm doing it, 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 I'm doing it. Ah! And then there's abject failure. Because we're still trying to look where? If I just get enough skill, if I just learn enough, if I just do enough, I'll be able to do it. As long as you have that mentality, this is going to crush you. Because God has to get you to a place where you, you become despondent in soul and you recognize what? I can't do it. I need help. Help me. So, <clears throat> in the beginning of this, he starts out with an argument about marriage. Like, right now I'm married to Beth. What's the only legal way that I'm allowed to marry somebody else? <laughs> you guys are, like, afraid. It wasn't a trick question. I am legally allowed to marry somebody else when she's dead, all right? In the vow, what do we say until death parts us? Okay. So she dies, I can marry another, right? 
vice versa. I die, she can marry another. Either way, go totally legal, totally good, totally right. So Paul starts out with an argument. And he says, you used to be married to this. The problem is, this killed you. My brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. To him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit to God. So now my Christianity is not about trying to follow this. Now listen very carefully what I'm saying. You're doing great. Uh, my Christianity is not about trying to follow this. My Christianity is just about loving him. Okay? I am now dead to the law, but I'm alive to Jesus. Meaning, Christianity for me is no longer about following rules. Do rules exist in Christianity? For example, do rules exist in my marriage with Beth? They absolutely do. Without question. There's lots of rules. <laughs> and, and did you hear Faith? She goes, and she makes them. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> There's lots of rules, lots of rules. But my, I would never say my relationship is based in the rules. I love my wife. She loves me. My motivation in the marriage is because I love a person. Marriage is not a set of rules to follow. It's a person who I'm in love with. In the same way, we no longer live for the law. We live for him. I love Jesus. So many Christians have forgotten that Jesus is a real person. And just that knowledge, that Jesus is a real person, changes the whole aspect. What it means is, for example, I'll give you an example. A troubling example in my life. There are some people in my life uh, that are important that um, I'm having a hard time freely speaking about Jesus to. Could be my problem the way that I speak it, but it could also be their issue as well. All right? So we don't know. That's kind of in flux. What I'm having a hard time is, let's pretend it wasn't Jesus, but my wife. Nobody in the, in the world would expect a relationship with me where I was not allowed to talk about my wife. That's expected, right? Or let's take away my wife and let's put my kids. General conversation would be all about my wife and my kids. That's expected. Well, I love him more than I love my wife and my kids. He is more important to me than my wife and my kids will ever be. The world does not understand that reality. So when somebody tells me, I love you, Chris, but I can't talk about Jesus, well, that's an impossible scenario. You've just made life impossible with me. You'd be hurt if I said you can't talk about your wife or your husband or your kids. Well, it's real simple. He beats them all. I've died to the law, and I now live for him. So you telling me that I can't talk about Jesus is impossible. Every single aspect of my life is him. Every single one. You can't even talk about axolotls, at least I can't, without bringing up Jesus. That's the only reason those creatures are in my house. <laughs> the simple fact of the matter is, he infects what? Every aspect of my life. Every aspect of my life, because I'm in love with him. See, you understand it when I mention my wife. You get it. She's a real person. Can you imagine how my wife would feel if I was with somebody and they said, I don't want to hear about your stupid wife. Your wife is just controversial. And, I, and, I, and then I go, okay, I won't bring her up. Can you imagine that scenario? Can you imagine somebody saying, I'm sick of hearing about your kids. You can't talk about your kids. Let's just talk about something else. What? 
No, you can't imagine that because that's ludicrous, isn't it? Well, I can't help but talk about Jesus Christ. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is the one that rescues me from this wretched body of death. I tried the rule way, and all I did was get crushed. And then I reached up, and I said, I need help. And he helped me. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is the one that I am married to. He took away the law. He fulfilled it for me so that I can now just live for him. Sometimes my old man gets in the way. I do not look for the strength inside me. What do I find in me? Weakness and failure, man. So I look outside of myself. I look to him. I look to another. And I say, I need help. And he rescues me. That's who Jesus is. Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. And we thank you for your beloved son, Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come, our righteous one. We thank you for, we thank you for him. In the name of Jesus, amen. And let's give...